Good morning, Westwood Church, and welcome to our online worship service. Thank you so much for joining us today. I definitely would love to uh, meet in person and to be able to communicate and uh, bring God's word to you in person, but we continue to be online, and so we're thankful for the the opportunities that we do have uh, to serve uh, the community and really the, the world uh, in much greater ways than we probably ever even imagined. Um, I want to especially welcome uh, the person who's joined us today who has never uh, connected with Westwood Church before. If this is your first time, uh, I want to welcome you and I truly pray that, um, that as we meet together, as we worship and as we come under the, the teaching of God's word, that, uh, that God would speak to you. And so um, to that end, uh, we're, we're in the book of Psalms this summer, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 77. So I'd invite you to take your, your Bibles and, and follow along as we um, work through this passage, which I believe is very, very relevant for, for many people today. Um, so let me pray for us as we, as we look to God's word. Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, the, the living, active word that you've given to us, that you entrusted to us so many years ago. Uh, we, we embrace it as truth, and we invite your spirit to speak to us as we look to it today to guide us for, for faith and for life. Um, thank you for each one who's joining us, and, and I pray that you would minister to them. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, a fellow by the name of Jared Wilson, a Christian fellow, wrote a book, and he called, he called this book The Imperfect Disciple. And I think he was hoping to help imperfect people like me and like you understand that it's possible for us to follow Jesus in spite of how we feel or in spite of how we express ourselves. And he writes something uh, fairly uh, astonishing, actually. Um, he says this at one part in his book. He says, sometimes I read books and articles on discipleship, and I wonder who in the world they're written for. And then I remember, oh yeah, for people who give the Sunday school answers in Sunday school, but save the real life or death grasping for meaning, gasping for breath, grappling with God for those rare moments when they're all alone, undistracted, and unable to fend off the crashing sense of their own inadequacies and apprehensions about the world and their place in it. I tend to think, Wilson says, that a lot of the ways the evangelical church teaches discipleship seem designed for people who don't appear to really need it. Now, as a pastor, that sounds pretty harsh. <laughs> but the truth is, is that there are many people, many committed people to Jesus and to his body, the church, who are tired of the Sunday school answers. And they want to know that other people have struggles and questions and doubts about their faith and their life, and that one doesn't have to feel guilty about having those kinds of questions or doubts. Well, I have good, good news for each of us today. The Bible and the Psalms in particular give voice to our doubts. They give voice to our struggles and help us understand what to do with them. Now, maybe you've noticed, if you have read through the Psalms, even a little bit, that there's lots of questions raised by the writer of the Psalms that don't always have easy answers. Like, for instance, have you ever asked yourself why evil people prosper and good people uh, seem to struggle? That's a, that's a valid question of faith, and it's a question that's posed within the book of Psalms. Or why have you abandoned me, God, in my greatest time of need? Um, as I reflect back on uh, my years and my years in ministry, I I've known a few people over the time who've walked away from a relationship with God because they felt like God had ditched them at perhaps their most critical time in their life. And so now they don't want anything to do with him. That's a question that's raised in the Psalms. Or how about asking God to punish those people who we feel have wronged us? And we say, you get them, God. You, they've done me wrong, and, and I want them to pay. That is in the Psalms. And I confess before you that I have prayed that more than once. 
<laughs> now, the, the Psalms do have joy. They do have singing. They do have dancing. But you know what? They have a lot more of the dark stuff of life because the Psalms reflect a person's honest, raw emotions with the living God. If you read the Psalms closely enough, you may even question some of the theology that's written, not because God is something other than what he truly is and what he says he is, but because real people with real issues, people like you and me are expressing our imperfect selves and we're reaching out to God. A God who loves us in spite of our questions, in spite of our emotions and how we feel from day to day, and sometimes even in spite of the wrong theology that we might embrace of who he is. We've developed this idea that we can only approach God with joyful praise, but that's not the message of the scriptures. We don't come to God with just one emotion and so God gave us the book of Psalms to teach us how to follow him honestly with the entire range of human emotions that we experience. One person has said it this way, Psalms of lament, and that's what we're going to be looking at today in Psalm 77, Psalms of lament demonstrate just how deep our relationship with the Father really is. After all, we don't communicate our grief in our mourning to strangers, we save that for those we truly know and love. I've never thought about it that way. What a wonderful way to frame that idea. So in your Bibles, I want you to turn to Psalm 77, a psalm of lament where the writer, Asaph, is uncertain if prayer really works. Think about that. An author of part of the scriptures which God gave to us, and he's wondering if prayer works. Has, has that been your experience in the past? Maybe it's your experience right now. More than likely, it's going to hit you at some point as a disciple of Jesus. Does prayer really work? Does God care about me in my specific situation? I hope this psalm is going to bring encouragement and hope to you. Now, unlike a lot of the psalms where there's a very specific backstory, which can be found often in 1st and 2nd Samuel and sometimes in the book of Kings, this isn't true of Psalm 77. Uh, verse 9 hints that the problem might have come as a result of, of unfaithfulness of God's people towards him, but we don't know for sure. Whatever it was, Asaph, the writer, was at the end of himself. And so he writes, and this is where you can start following along in verse one. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. Like, it's kind of difficult to miss Asaph's despair. He's not convinced that calling out to God for help makes any difference. That's how he's feeling. Have you ever felt like that? Because sometimes it doesn't appear that prayer helps. As your, your pastor, I, I'd love to be able to tell you that if you've got a problem or, or a difficult situation that you're trying to plow through, the answer to that problem will always come through because of your prayer. That's the Sunday school answer. Uh, some of you might even remember uh, the old hymn writer. Uh, what, did he, what did he say? Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer. And that's what the church has sung uh, for the past century. Now, for the record, just in case you were wondering, I, I believe that prayer is powerful. I believe that prayer is, is effective. I believe that, that followers of Jesus need to be persistent in prayer. I am committed to that. James, the brother of Jesus, even reminds us. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
Prayer is very effective, but it doesn't always appear that way. And the psalmist, Asaph, gives us a perspective of one who has been trying to call out to God, but it doesn't seem to be making a difference. And it's physically and spiritually and emotionally exhausting. Yet in the process, Asaph is being real with God. And God can take that. <clears throat> you see, one of the things that a lot of uh, people and certainly a lot of Christians uh, kind of embrace is that we like formulas. We like formulas. If we pray, God answers and the problem is solved, right? That's, that's kind of the basic formula. So Asaph keeps his end of the deal. He cries out to God. He seeks God when he is in trouble. He's doing the right things. He stretches out his hand to the Lord and he keeps stretching out his hand without getting tired and without getting frustrated. So you would expect in our formula that Asaph has now done his part and therefore God will keep his end of the bargain and answer Asaph's prayers. But that's not what happens. Instead, Asaph says that his soul refuses to be comforted. When he remembers God, he continues to feel agitated. He has no relief. As a pastor, I, I get to connect and intersect with so many people. And, and I know that, uh, that some of you are living this right now. You have unbearable health challenges or somebody in your, your family circle has unbearable health challenges and it's dragging you to your knees, but nothing is improving and it doesn't seem like God is listening. Others are experiencing weighty relational tension with a spouse or with children and it keeps you awake at night and there is no relief in sight. We all have our stories. We want to believe in faith that prayer makes a difference, but how are we to respond when it seems, when it, when it looks like it doesn't? So this, this psalm has a huge lesson for us, for you and for me. Asaph didn't really anticipate probably sharing this lesson with us several millennia later to the North American church, but he has a huge lesson for, for you, for me, for the North American church that's often bent on living the good life of health and wealth. When it seems, when it looks like prayer doesn't help, we need to be reminded that God isn't a vending machine. And you're saying, well, that's real deep, Rob. Like, thanks for giving me that lesson. But isn't it true? With vending machines, we're used to popping in a loony or a toonie and we press a button and we wait for the bag of chips or the chocolate bar to drop. And if it doesn't, what do we do? We either, um, you know, uh, start banging and shaking the machine because it's supposed to work. And if that doesn't help, we, we complain to the nearest person who can help us trying to get our product, or we give it a, a shove and we walk away in disgust. We put in our order and it delivers what we want. But God isn't a vending machine. God is God. So we cannot treat our relationship with God as a transaction. I do this and he does that. Just because we call out to him and do so with persistence doesn't mean that he will answer in our time frame or in the manner we hope, but that does not make God any less. And oh, like we struggle with this. We struggle with this greatly. And it doesn't get any easier when, when the challenging situation persists. We, we think about a guy like Asaph. Here's a guy who's in deep trouble. He, he drives himself to prayer past the point of exhaustion and he gets no relief. And you read that and you go, well, that doesn't sound very comforting. 
But the truth remains that just because we think we're doing all the right things doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the results that we want, even in prayer. And that can be super challenging for many of us who want to live our version of the good life and, and quite frankly, who believe that if God really does love us, he should answer our prayers in our way and in our timing. Now, at the very beginning of this sermon, I, I said that a lot of people aren't looking for Sunday school answers, remember? So the question is, are you still interested in, in listening to what this psalmist has to teach us? Now, if one of the things that Asaph is teaching is that God is not a vending machine, even though Asaph didn't realize he was teaching us that, he's also demonstrating personally that it's okay to be honest with God. Like, God can handle it. We don't, we don't need to try and protect God. And I think sometimes churches and church leaders, even with the best of intentions, create an environment or can create an environment it's in which it's not really safe to be honest about our questions of faith or our challenges in life. But in that kind of environment, your relationship with God, my relationship with God will never be as sturdy as it could be and it needs to be. Uh, a number of years ago, I found myself in a situation like this with a group of church leaders in a former leadership context. And, I, and I've realized, uh, though uh, this group of leaders was a wonderful group of individuals and they loved the Lord as wonderful as they were, th the environment had become a very unsafe place to be honest about struggles, to have healthy, productive discussions about matters of faith in life, secondary matters of faith, to wrestle in a good way along our journey of discipleship. And unfortunately, those kinds of environments become very discouraging because when people realize that, that it's unsafe to ask onyx questions about God, what happens? Well, walls go up between people and it prevents one from being transparent and authentic with, with those around them as fellow uh, disciples on a faith journey. Now, does God know it all? Yes, he, he knows it all. But it's just as important to be honest with others as it is with God. Because when we know that there are other people on the journey with us, we can help one another grow in our relationship with God in the midst of the questions and the challenges of faith that we have. Our faith becomes more sturdy. It, it becomes more robust. It can, it can withstand uh, even greater storms. So Asaph in Psalm 77, he gives us permission to say, I've been praying, but to be honest, it just doesn't feel like God is listening. I've been going through a hard time, and no matter how uh, much I pray, I'm just not feeling any better. Do you know what? God can handle our honesty. So we need to become better at being honest with God and with other people on the journey of faith in a safe environment that, that actually helps us to grow deeper in our walk with Jesus. Now, now one of the things that good people, even pastors, will encourage uh, those who are struggling in times of difficulty, um, they invite them to remember the past to kind of recall how God has delivered them or how God has answered a prayer or how God has shown up or, or provided in the past. You know what? I'm all for that. I've told that to people. I practice it myself. In, in fact, I'm actually, I'm doing this right now as I think about our church family and I think about where we're at as a church family. Like, where are we at? Um, that, that's, that's a question. Who are we? <laughs> where are we? 
<laughs> what will Westwood Church look like? What, how will Westwood Church function uh, once COVID-19 surrenders to medical science? You see, I believe that God is faithful to his church and always has been. I believe that God will guide us forward and through this season. But it's just kind of, it's kind of difficult to imagine what that might look like. And so I need to remember how he has done it before so that I can stand firm in the present. Because of how I have witnessed God in the past, I, I, I remember these things and I camp on these things and I remind others of them. And you know what? You need to do the same as well. Keep track of how God has blessed you in the past. Journal it, write it down, remind yourself of that. It's going to encourage you in the face of the struggles that you might have currently. But Asaph tells us that even remembering the past um, ways in which God has worked isn't always foolproof uh, for how we feel about it. He, he's not comforted. Verse five, I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Like he's piling question upon question, asking the same thing. Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? You see, Asaph is doing the right thing. He is scouring his past to find consolation. And he even, he even talks about the songs that he sang in the night to help him remember. Uh, maybe you've done that. I have. But this time, these memories don't necessarily uh, change how he feels. And he wonders if God has changed. Well, we know the answer to that question. Has God changed? No. God hasn't changed, but again, sometimes it feels different. And, and this is where it helps for you and me to be where we at, where we are at in our history. You see, we can look to Jesus. We can look to Jesus and we can actually see what God has done for us through Jesus. We can know that God is for us because he actually sent his one and only son to die for you and for me. God hasn't changed. Asaph didn't have the, the, the luxury of, of actually uh, witnessing the, the person of Jesus. We actually do. Um, the words of the apostle Paul also help us um, in our point in history. Paul says in Romans chapter eight, he says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Because of where we are at in history, we can, we can actually look back and, and we can know that God is who he said he is and, and he has not changed. We know that God is for us. But sometimes it doesn't feel like that. And so Asaph reminds us of one last really, really important truth. And again, he didn't realize that he was going to be teaching us these lessons several millennia later. And perhaps, perhaps this is one that you need to embrace personally. If you find yourself in a tough spot right now, wondering if God hears you, if God cares about you, if it's worth it to continue to call out to God. And here's, here's the important lesson. Our feelings aren't very reliable. Our feelings aren't very reliable. You know, if we were, if we were in person, I would, I would ask an amen. I'd, I'd specifically ask John Barriger to just give me a big, big, loud amen. You see, you cannot build a doctrine 
on who God is and how he functions based on your personal experience and your personal feelings. Our feelings Our emotions, they are far too flighty and fleeting. They are insecure and unstable. We feel one way one day, and we feel another way the next. How often have you and I made decisions based on how we were feeling maybe in the moment, whether they were good or bad? I bet you you could come up with a long list. I, I made a decision and some, some years ago now uh, to buy a used GMC Envoy. This Envoy had more options than I needed and all the bells and whistles you could imagine. And, and based on every other vehicle that I had looked at, the seller should have been asking a whole lot more money. And maybe, maybe that should have been my first clue. But I saw that shiny interior. I saw the bells and the whistles. And you know what? It made me feel so good. And the seller seemed so nice. And the price made me giddy. Everything lined up perfectly. What could be wrong about this decision, I thought, when everything feels so right? Well, everything could be wrong with that decision. It turned out to be my worst vehicle mistake ever. But besides my wedding day, besides the birth of my children, the happiest day of my life was when I saw the taillights of that envoy drive away with someone else at the wheel eight years after I bought it. Our feelings, whether good or bad, but especially the negative ones, often lead us to believe things about faith and life and other people and God and the church that are not accurate. And they lead us to make decisions that simply aren't very reliable. Do you know one one very important mark of a maturing disciple of Jesus is found right here. Building our faith on emotion is not wise because our emotions, our feelings are are unreliable. They're a part of who we are, but because we're imperfect disciples, they're not always reliable. Yeah, we can be honest with God about our feelings, but our feelings often Uh, take us down stray paths of what is actually true. So we need to bring our emotions and our feelings in line with what we really know to be true. So you're thinking, wow, Rob, this is really not a joyful psalm. Like, give me something good. Well, I said that more of the psalms are laments than something else. So if you want to mature in your faith, you need to wrestle with all of the scriptures. So you want something good? Here it is. When you find yourself in a challenging situation like Asaph, maybe you're experiencing it right now with a a very, very um, difficult uh, spot or season you find yourself in and you're calling out to God, you're crying out to him, you don't know if anything is working for you, here's what you need to hold on to. Hold on to what's true even if you can't see it. Hold on to what is true, even if you can't see it. Verse 10, it's a turning point in Psalm 77. Asaph says, then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. To this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. This is an amazing image. You see, Asaph hasn't personally experienced everything that God had done throughout history to that point, but but he appeals to it. He appeals to it. He chooses to believe that God has led his people through some very challenging seasons in the past 
even when all the prayers and the dark nights of the soul and the crying out to the Lord didn't appear to work. So, so Asaph even recounts the crossing of the Red Sea, verses 16 to 20. You can read that on your own. When a million plus Israelites stood at the shoreline and those Israelites are absolutely terrified, they are freaked out. They have been crying out to God for help for centuries by this time. And just when they thought he had listened to their prayers and their feelings were starting to change, he brings them to the edge of the Red Sea where there's nothing but water before them and an angry Egyptian army behind them. Like, can you begin to imagine what they're feeling and what they're thinking? They must have been thinking that God was punishing them, that God was some kind of a a cruel jokester because Israel dreaded the sea. In their worldview, it was where bad things happened. It was where the dead reside. Remember Jonah being asked to be thrown into the sea? Israel's thinking, well, like, where to now? We're we're as good as dead, standing by the sea. What are you thinking, God? And then in a way that they never would have imagined, God stretches out his hand and he does the unthinkable. He makes a way for the Israelites through the sea. Your path, Asaph says, led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. See, God God made a way through the most difficult, unimaginable pathway the Israelites could have thought, and he delivered his children to the other side. He didn't tell them in advance that's how it was going to happen. Why would he? He's God. If it had been up to Israel, they would have asked for a different way. They would have pressed a different button on the vending machine. But remember, God's not a vending machine. God is a God who cares deeply about his people and who has led them through. Who's led them through their time of greatest need. He didn't take the situation away. But he did lead them through it. In a pathway that they didn't even know was possible. Now, Asaph, he hadn't experienced that event personally, but Asaph chose to appeal to it because in spite of how he was feeling, Asaph knew that it was true. And so he could trust it. You you may be in a very challenging circumstance right now, a very difficult season of life. You're calling out to God for help, but it doesn't seem to be working. You may even have some personal ideas as to how you want to get get through it, whether or not those are God's ways or not. I don't know, and, and you may not know either. But can I ask you this morning, as you think about what God is saying to you through his word, to appeal to what is true. Even when you don't see him, even when it feels like he's not listening, even when you're uncertain if he really cares, this is what is true. Because of Jesus, God's promises to his people are sure. He is present with you, as he is present with me and present with us. He desires to minister to you in the midst of your very real and very personal challenge. What's true is that his grace is sufficient for you today. And just as God has been faithful to his people in the past, God will continue to be faithful to his people today as he walks with you through it. 
I want to pray with you and with us as we commit God's word to our very lives. It's living, it's active, God's spirit is moving. And so I would invite you to wherever you are to invite the Lord to speak to you. Would you, would you bow with me as we pray together? Lord, again, we just, we surrender to the authority of your word. We committed it to you at the beginning of, of this message, and we believe that you have been speaking through it and by your spirit to your people. So in your wisdom, in your foreknowledge, would you meet each one where they're at, especially those who really resonate with, um, with Asaph's story? And would you encourage them today? Would you remind them of what is true? And would you show in very tangible ways that you are actually walking with them through this very difficult season. And so we commit each one to you and to your care, and we, we commit our church family to you, and we pray that you, who is all wise and all knowing, will continue to build this, this bride, this body of Christ, which you love very much and know, know everything about. Would you continue uh, to, to build us up in faith and in love. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you're with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to wish you um, God's blessing as you move on from here, uh, go about your day. I, I hope that you can experience some holiday time, some rest time. And in all things, would you continue to look to God who is faithful to you in all seasons of life. Have a wonderful week.